Got it. Okay, we're recording. So go ahead and get started. Laurel, if you see anybody else hopping on, please admit them. Awesome. Okay, so um, welcome. My name is Jess Sappington. I'm the Food Systems Program Coordinator for the Regional Small Farms Program. I'm based out of Kitsap County Extension. Tonight's our latest Dirt Talk Farmer to Farmer event, and we're going to be discussing downy mildew. For those that have not attended a Dirt Talk previously, events are hosted by our WSU Regional Small Farms Program in conjunction with a local farmer or ag specialist that's willing to, willing to share their expertise on a given topic. So tonight we're excited to have Laurel Moulton with us, who's our regional IPM specialist for Clallam, Jefferson, and Kitsap counties, as well as local farmer Scott Chichester, who's the owner of Chai's Farm in Squim. Um, the discussion is going to be presentation style, so if you have questions, please feel free to utilize the chat box. Um, our presenters will most likely be stopping at points to answer those for the group, and since we're a small group today, that should be fairly easy, um, but we will definitely do our best to circle back to any unanswered questions throughout and at the end. Um, we should definitely also have um, time for some questions at the end with um, further discussion amongst the group because we've allotted until 7.30. If we take up the whole time, that's great. That means everybody's engaging and discussing. And if we don't, that's okay as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Laurel um, to start with an introduction of herself and then to Scott. Thank you, Jess. Um, it's good to be here. I'm Laurel Moulton. I work with the Regional Small Farms Program and also the Master Gardener Program um, in Clallam County out of Port Angeles. Um, I enjoy working with plants and diagnosing pests and disease issues and helping folks figure out um, integrated pest management solutions to, to what's going on. So um, I'm looking forward to presenting with Scott today and I'll let him introduce himself. Hi there, I'm Scott Chichester and I have Chai's Farm in Squim, Washington. Um, we're a relatively small um, organic vegetable farm. Um, got about eight acres of production. And one thing that uh, we've stepped into is a lot more uh, greenhouse production in the last few years, thanks to the USDA high tunnel grant with just under an acre of covered space now. Um, but in addition to that, um, lots of field crops as well. Uh, pretty diverse operation um, in terms of what we're producing um, with a real heavy focus on salad mix. Great, thanks, uh, Scott. So um, I'm just gonna jump in. What I'm gonna do is first, just give kind of an overview of what downy mildew is. Um, it's life cycle, um, the hosts, and, uh, and some general information on integrated pest management tools to deal with it. And then I'll turn it over to Scott and he can talk about his experience with um, downy mildew on his farm. Okay, so I, I wanted to start off with what is downy mildew um, versus powdery mildew because um, that's that's where the confusion is for most people. Um, in fact, we got a couple of questions beforehand that that we were expecting asking what the difference was. So today we are focusing on downy mildew, which is in the photo to the lower right. Um, that's how it looks on cucumbers. Um, and it's uh, powdery mildew is the, the photo in the center. Um, and the difference is with powdery mildew, you generally have a white dusting um, on the, I was gonna say on the tops of the leaves, but it gets underneath as well. Um, and yeah, so it's a, in powdery, powdery mildew is a fungus. Um, it's favored by high humid, high humidity conditions, but not necessarily leaf wetness. In fact, you know, one of the recommendations is hosing the plants down. Um, for downy mildew, it's, it's uh, a different organism completely called a water mold. Um, this organism, they used to be called fungus-like organisms. And in fact, if you, if you read about downy mildew, some people still call it a fungus, but it's more related to brown algae and, and green plants than fungus. Um, it causes leaf discoloration and then the um, and then kind of gray purple tan kind of fluff on the underside of the leaf. Um, and I put a, an asterisk next to the 
uh, in powdery mildew by the white powdery spots, I should have put an asterisk as well in the, the next to leaf discoloration in the purple and gray fluff, um, because each of those can present a little bit differently depending on the crop. So um, with downy mildew, that specifically likes uh, water on the surface of the leaf in addition to high humidity. So the hosts of downy mildew are pretty broad. Um, and looks like I have some labels that wandered off their pictures, but <laughs> anyway, um, downy mildew can, can infect uh, brassicas and other greens. So anything in the brassica family, when I say other greens, I mean lettuce, spinach, chard, um, things like that. Um, it can get onions, basil, um, cucurbits, so cucumbers and squash, um, melons, but we don't worry about that too, <laughs> too much around here. Um, ornamental flowers or flowers that you might use as um, uh, diversity crops in your, on your farms, um, hops and grapes. Um, so there's, there's a, a broad uh, range of, of different hosts. The symptoms traditionally, as I mentioned, are um, if you look at the top of the leaf, you, it might turn yellow or lighter green. Oftentimes the spots are kind of angular in nature. Like, so when you're looking at this photo in the top right corner of cucumber, you can see it's kind of between the veins uh, and a little bit angular. Um, on the spinach here, it's not quite as angular, but still yellow, light green. Um, and if you were to flip that leaf over, you would see the sporulation on the, on the bottom. And this is an up close picture of, of what it looks like on basil. Um, uh, and I didn't put any pictures up here because they weren't related to vegetables, but um, there is, a, for example, a downy mildew that infects impatiens, those, those plants that people put in little pots on their front porch. Um, and that, if you flipped over the leaf, would actually be white, but um, that's, mm -hmm. that's uh, um, unusual. Um, I'm just going to give a, a basic light, a, a, an example of a life cycle here for spinach. Um, this, uh, because there's different, there's actually different species or different varieties or strains of, of downy mildew that infect specific plants. So the one that, that infects spinach isn't going to be the one that infects your, cu your cucumbers or the one that gets your impatiens, same thing. So um, lots of different, different ones. So on spinach, spinach, it's, um, it's this bugger. I'm not going to pronounce that name, but you can read it. <laughs> and they're, um, I, I mentioned them They're They're called water molds before, but, uh, omycete is, is the scientific name for this organism. Um, they, um, so with the life cycle here, there's, there's some different names of, of structures that kind of are similar to fungus, but, but they're not. Um, so if you, if you look over here, there's, um, they, they have sporangia that can be windborne um, instead of spores. So once these land on the leaf surface, um, you can see these, these are called zoospores in A here. The reason they're called zoospores is they actually have tails on them and they swim in, the, in the, uh, a film of water on the surface of those leaves. So um, they go and infect the plant, you get symptoms here. Um, once those leaves fall to the ground and die, they, they produce more reproductive reproductive structures and these, these oospores here can overwinter in the soil. Um, so that's that. The, the, the oospores, in addition to being soil borne, those can be transmitted on seeds. Um, in mild winter areas, un unlike powdery mildew, powdery mildew is something we see mostly kind of mid-season. Um, with the downy mildew, that can be a year-round thing. Um, it just may be a slower infection. And what else do I just say? Yeah, so example there. Um, I like to talk about the life cycles because there's certain points in the life cycle that you can target it for management. And so the, the red circles are kind of, <laughs> um, you can target the, uh, when they're swimming around on the leaf surface or, you know, or germinating on the leaf surface, you can target these, these, um, 
uh, these O spores that are kind of storage dormant spores, um, you can also target this point where the there's symptoms on the leaf and that leaf is is you know falling to the ground in the detritus um, in the field. So for IPM monitoring, just know what you're looking for, educate your employees. Um, if you're bringing in vegetable starts from off the farm, check those out when they're coming in. If they don't look well, uh, toss them. It's, it's not worth it. Uh, you know, bringing something you, you don't know onto your farm. Um, and then there's, I, I did say you can have seed tested. I don't think it's practical for most farms of the size that are out here, but I just wanted to put that there. Um, these are some other examples of what uh, downy mildew looks like on onions. Um, you can see the that kind of uh, gray purplish uh, fluff there. Um, this is what it looks like on the seeds of radishes. And so this is a little bit different. It has um, kind of white spots on it. Um, and this is kind of the overall discoloration on a broccoli leaf. Those are great photos. I. Um, I take no credit for them. I stole them all from the Pacific Northwest Handbook. Um, and, and so you guys all have access to that as well. Um, okay, so for cultural management, um, know your sources of your seeds and your tra transplants. Um, there is um, on a couple different uh, papers I've read that you can actually soak seeds at um, 122 degrees Fahrenheit for 25 minutes and that will kill the the um, the dormant um, oospores on the seeds, um, and when I say know your sources, there, there's some uh, there's some seed companies that will list if they guarantee their seed to be disease free, or maybe it's a small seed company and you know you just know how they work and you know that they aren't going to be packaging packaging up seeds from a field that was infested with with something like this. Um, you know, just general sanitizing. So clean, clean soil trays and equipment. Um, if you're visiting another farm and they have a problem with a disease like this, make sure you sanitize your boots or, and other implements or clothing you might have with you. Um, and let's see. And so minimizing spread within your farm, there's different um, uh, techniques you can use with irrigation to minimize it. Um, you can use um, different techniques to minimize humidity, uh, to control humidity in a greenhouse setting. Um, if you know that you have downy mildew on your farm, you can make sure that you work in, in parts of your field that are clean first before moving to the, and work in areas that, that may be infested last. Um, and then uh, burying or turning under plant debris. Um, and then I put UV at the bottom because one, one thing is, is these uh, uh, certain structures of this disease can be killed by sunlight. It's just that anything that has to do, it depends on the sun around here, right? um, is, is, is questionable. I know in SWIM, you guys have a little bit more sun than we have in Port Angeles, but um, anyway, sun can help you, but I just don't, that may be more practical in like Colorado or Southern California. Um, so there's other things you can do, planting resistant varieties. I just gave an example here of basil, but um, you can find lists of other resistant varieties of spinach and, and other common vegetable crops. So um, for example, on the um, Pacific North, Northwest Disease Management Handbook, they, they list different varieties of basil um, that are known to be resistant, have some, some sort of resistance. So um, basically all sweet basil is susceptible, but you can get some that have moderate or high resistance. Um, I didn't put the list here because it was long, um, but you can go find that um, yourself if you'd like. Um, and yeah, there's, there's different species of basil as well. So, so sweet basil is definitely susceptible. Lemon basil and American basil have um, seemed to be resistant. Um, to, to find out about resistant, um, cultivars, you can, there's certain ones in the Pacific Northwest Man uh, Disease Management Handbook, which are, they have lists, 
but also there's certain seed providers that that list varieties that are resistant to certain um, you know economically important diseases. And I just put some examples there, but I don't know. Scott might have some others or people who are listening in. If you have recommendations, um, we'd love to hear those. For chemical and bio and biocontrol. Um, uh, fungicides are recommended for this, even though it's not a fungus. And since it's not a fungus, the fungicides can be um, a little bit uh, not as effective as they would be on fungus. Um, but uh, biofungicides, these are kind of a newer thing on the scene. Um, and, and the idea behind those is that you spray this product on, on the leaves or, or for other diseases, you might do a root drench. And uh, it's there's there's some other type of fungus or organism that will colonize the surface of the plant or the roots or whatever you're targeting um, to fill up space so the pathog pathogenic organisms can't come in. Um, they also, there's some evidence that some of them actually stimulate resistance, uh, systemic resistance in the host plant. Um, these are still kind of up and coming. And so um, these, oops, sorry about that. Um, these are some examples that are listed in the Pacific Northwest Handbook, um, but many of them haven't been tried in our area. So those are still, they're, they're worth looking into and, and trying, but, um, but definitely there's more information to be had about them. Okay, so I just uh, usually, uh, I'll just end this by giving you some resources. Um, I don't know, Jess, if you can put a link to the Pacific Northwest handbooks in the chat box, but that's always a good resource. That's all the pictures I'm using in this presentation are from there. Um, if you type in a disease like downy mildew, they'll give you a whole list of all the different, um, different vegetable crops or fruit crops that it might be on. So you can look up your specific uh, crop that you're interested in. Um, there, there's a fewer publications, uh, extension publications on downy mildew, but Oregon State University has a couple. I don't know if anybody on here grows hops or grapes, but those are uh, those are the ones that are listed with Oregon State University. So um, with that, that's just the kind of background and basics. And I'll turn it over to, um, to Scott to talk about um, downy mildew experience on your farm. Cool. Well, thank you, Laurel. That was um, an awesome bunch of information that you put together there. Um, I, I like uh, all the resources that you have there. And I took some, I took a few notes that I'll try and, I'll try and incorporate into what I have to say here um, about stuff that I saw. Um, my Biggest experience with downy mildew really has been on spinach. Um, and so I'll speak mostly to that um, from my farm. And then with basil, I haven't had any real experience with it, but have avoided it um, through some uh, tactics and have seen it on other on another farm in the peninsula here. So I know it's around and have seen how devastating it can be. So I've been scared into taking um, some steps to make sure that I don't end up with it if at all possible. Um, so I think that with either of those two crops and probably with some other ones, but I pay less attention to uh, this topic, um, resistances within varieties um you know plant this is where plant breeding has really shown its benefits for commercial growers i think um and part of that is a little bit out of uh you know the monoculture big egg world that is spinach in the wet southern west coast and um south southwest areas of california and, and to a less 30 degree arizona um and so the i reached out to um, one of the seed reps at high mowing um my friend ada snyder and asked her a little bit about um about how she sees downy mildew uh resistances progressing if there's any new info um and you know her 
she reiterated what I had heard her say before is that it's constantly evolving. There are always new races. And so kind of the, I'll say conventional, not meaning conventional ag, but just conventional mindset of plant breeders has been just keep breeding single gene resistance to try and stay ahead of whatever new race there is. Um, and by race, I mean, you know, a new strain, a genetically distinct, um, different um, downy mildew that will attack that crop. And so I think that she said that they're up to uh, somewhere closing in on 20 different known races that impact the spinach crops. So what that really means in, in practice is that if you see downy mildew starting to happen on a spinach variety, it's really worth learning to look at what a seed catalog, um, sometimes it's listed on a, on a seed packet label, but the seed catalogs generally have this info and they'll say DM for downy mildew resistance, and then it'll list a number or a series of numbers. And sometimes it'll be one dash three, comma four comma six dash seven and and what those are referring to are the different races of downy mildew that that variety shows some significant resistance to and by resistance that means doesn't mean that it will never get it it just means that it, it as a plant generally will avoid getting it most of the time um the thing that's really confusing about this is we don't always end up with the same race from season to season in an area. Um, and it can change from season to season. And so if you're always planting the same variety every year and you start to get it, um, you might look and see, you know, well, what's the resistance like on that variety if you can find it and then try and find a variety that has a resistance to any of the gaps that you see and be able to start to plant that. One of my strategies is kind of twofold, is that I'll often plant more than one variety at any given seeding date, knowing that those two varieties will have slightly different maturities for harvest, but they often will have slightly different resistances as well. Um, that all being said, I've never honed in on which races have been a problem for me, even though I've seen downy mildew on my spinach and it's caused some significant losses, I haven't been, I don't know, organized enough or fortunate enough in my um, duplicity of varieties that I would have planted to be able to say, ah, variety A got it, variety B didn't get it, variety A is lacks resistance to you know, race five and variety B has resistance to race five. That's a technique that you can use to try and determine which race is out there in your field causing problems. I've just never been so with it that I've successfully implemented that. Um, and so it's, it's just good when you're, you know, when you're shopping for seeds, just to kind of know and keep that in the back of your mind, especially if it's something that you've seen with spinach in the past. Um, that being said, how you're harvesting uh, your spinach, whether you're growing it for a baby leaf crop or a bunching crop or a continual pick for as long as you can crop are kind of going to dictate how much impact downy mildew is going to have on a spinach crop. Um, if you're going for a baby leaf crop, a lot of times you are simultaneously increasing the likelihood that you are going to conditions that are conducive to downy mildew because you have a dense planting. And so you're going to get less airflow and more humidity in the time of the year when downy mildew could be a problem. However, you're going to cut that crop off at a much younger stage. And what I've found is that I often will avoid major infestations even when I see it beginning to show up in the field because I'm cutting my spinach so young. So um, if it's a baby leaf stage and I start to see when I'm scouting the field thinking about is this field ready, I'll start to see that that top of the leaf, that little bit of yellowing and it usually starts in just a few select little spots 
and then will blow up from there very rapidly. And so if I can catch it where I see the first little inklings of an infestation and we can harvest almost immediately within a day, um, we usually avoid any significant losses. But if we have to wait three or four or five days, it's usually enough that um, the spinach has continued to grow and the disease has continued to spread that it will cause a problem. Um, bunching spinach is usually in the ground for another week longer than um, baby leaf before you're ready to bunch it. And so it has a lot more time to uh, spread through a patch. And in situations where I've been doing bunching spinach, um, I've much more frequently had just total crop loss due to the downy mildew um, because it's out there for just that extra week of time. Um, I highly recommend like just keeping an eye on, on crops. And because spinach is often something that as growers we're planting very frequently, uh, if we're planning on having successions readily available throughout the season, um, if you're doing it in the same field, um, anything that's downwind, especially of where you start to see any signs of it showing up, you really wanna be careful of. And um, I found it really interesting, Laurel, that you had mentioned um, that it can, uh, it can live in the soil, you know, that some of the spores will live in the soil. Um, and I'm kind of curious because when I've, tilled it in, my, my main strategy of dealing with it is I see it and I just get out the tiller and I till that in and I try and bury it and incorporate it into soil as fast as I can um, and just not let it sporely if at all possible. I don't know if that means that any of those spores I'm just burying into the soil, um, but my experience has not been that that field is horrendously prone to downy mildew in the future moving forward. Um, you know, one could suppose that if you have a good organic soil with a lot of biology going on, um, maybe you're killing a lot of the spores that enter the soil. No proof, no idea what's really going on there. Um, for me, it's been a pretty effective strategy to deal with it. And so I just try and make that happen unless it's too wet to get in there until I just try and turn it in as fast as I possibly can. Um, I was I was going to say that that um, among the recommendations for the various crops, tilling it in or burying it is one of the most highly recommended things. So I I'll have to read more about what that relationship is. Um, a lot of times it just it it just uh, lives with the kind of more the detritus. Um, that's that's the bigger kind of keeper of it. So burying the residue. Um, is what is is highly recommended. So you're right. You're doing yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I I have a lot of faith in you know the active biology of the top you know six inches of the soil to deal with a lot of pathogens. You know, if you have a good soil, you have a lot going on in there, and I think that 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 can um, reduce a lot of the the potential load that you would have of, of future in, infestations. Um, and then you made a point of it uh, being in oh. OMIC with zoospores that swim um, in leaf moisture film. And I would totally concur um, with that. And so during the, the summer season, one thing that I didn't see was um, uh, there wasn't a optimum temperature range um, of when it happens, but I tend to find if it's out in the field, it's something that doesn't happen super early in the spring when it's cooler and it doesn't happen as much super late in the fall, although it can. Um, there's just more diseases that tend to happen fully early in the fall than there are in the spring, just as things build up. Um, but it, you know, it seems that the warmer, what we consider warm, humid conditions um, really favor its it's uh, spread. And, you know, so I try and manage that as much as I can with um, irrigation. And so I'll favor certain times of the day. If I know, like we have typically a lot of summer winds. So if I can irrigate for a couple hours in the morning and then get the afternoon to be windy and sunny and dry off the, those leaves before it goes into the dewy nighttime, because our nights are 
dewy more often than not during the summer here. Um, that really limits the number of hours that we have um, free moisture available. Um, if I start watering at five in the middle of the summer, it's going to be wet for the duration of the afternoon, then it's going to go into the, the dewy night and those leaves are going to stay wet all night long and it's going to hold that moisture and humidity that much longer and give those zoospores that much more opportunity to swim around and infect a leaf. So, um, you know, timing of irrigation ten, tends to be one of my biggest strategies and then um, trying to irrigate a little more uh, deeply, less frequently. Um, you know, so when I get spinach growing, I'll get it up and germinated. I'll water it pretty hard when it's still relatively small and try and put a lot of moisture in the ground so that I don't have to water it much afterwards. And it takes another week or so before it starts to use much water in a soil that's not real sandy. I can usually get by with two waterings once right when it emerges and then maybe one more, um, a week before I harvest and so if I can just minimize the number of times that I have that free water from irrigation and kind of the the subsequent humidity that it creates around the leaves um, as the soil is really wet that seems to be a good tactic at minimizing how much it's present on the farm. Um, let's see just looking through my notes here um, and then you had said burying in, under the cultural management slide, you had talked about burying debris. Um, we try and be pretty proactive that as soon as we are done harvesting out a spinach crop that we get in and we uh, till that we till that up and try and bury as much of that debris as possible. Um, a lot of that is that in some instances we are going to double crop that space. And so we're trying to get the decomposition happening, but I feel like it's it's a pretty good practice to just limit the growth of those pathogens on crop residue and, and living plants that are still in, in place, but maybe have been damaged and somewhat compromised or wounded when you go through and you cut something, but you leave some of the plants still there. Um, so let's see, that I think is, is most of what I have for spinach. I think that um, those pictures that you had where you showed both the, the top and the bottom of the leaves were great. Um, that, that yellow look, that chloritic yellow look on the top of the leaf really stands out from a patch of, of good healthy green spinach. And so um, it's really your first clue and it's good to walk a whole spinach patch frequently. And um, yes, uh, that bottom right one there to just look for that kind of a look um, in, the, in the field in a spinach patch will really help you minimize um, the spread of it if you can catch that quickly. I've never, I've personally never gone to the trouble to try and find those plants, rogue them out and you know, do something else with them to remove them or do anything else. But, um, you know, and maybe in a small situation that would be effective. I, I can't really speak to that. I don't know. Um, the one thing that I will say, you had talked about products that are being tested, um, just based on the nature of how spinach grows by the time you see it, um, it's too late. You know, it's like putting something on afterwards is not really, um, something that's going to be effective. And I, I would be pretty surprised if it'd be cost effective to be spraying spinach preventatively. Um, I do think that there's a lot more to be gained from um, just trying to look for downy mildew resistant varieties and plant those than um, products that can come in and, and save the day at the 11th hour. Um, so that's, that's most of what I have to say about um, the spinach part of it. Um, there's not any questions or comments about that to directly answer. Mm -hmm. um, Sorry, I was just going to say I I, um, I neglected to mention exactly what you said with with um, downy mildew, just like fungus, you can't cure it. Um, any of the the chemicals or biofungicides or whatever that are recommended for it are are preventative. So thanks for for calling that out, Scott. Yeah. Um, so 
if I move into um, spinach a little, or uh, I'm sorry, not spinach, um, basil, um, this is one again where we really look to um, plant breeding to kind of be our be our salvation to still have pesto and um, and not be totally without um, basil. Often, you know, we we tend to grow it in a much different fashion than spinach. It's a crop that has a much longer time before harvest. Um, it takes some more babying and we put a lot more money per plant into it. So to end up having it as we're ready to harvest, having downy mildew present when we're ready to harvest is a much bigger loss. Um, and so, whereas spinach, I will, if I see it, I just till it in and I don't think twice and um, move on to the next rotation. Um, basil's a, a little bit different mentality about it. And so I really try and be careful about um, some of those cultural practices that you were talking about where um, I'm using new, I'm using new pots when I'm potting up my basil starts in the greenhouse. And I'm trying to just use real good hygienic practices to minimize the potential that I'm bringing it in from um, a pot that I used in the previous season or from detritus that was um, laying around somewhere. And then um, I shop for varieties that are um, specifically downy mildew resistant. Um, if you look at uh, some of the ones that have come out more recently um, include for, for a town kind of Italian types are Prospera, um, and then Rutgers University has done some good work and they have a whole series of ones that they've um, done, but they have devotion, obsession, and passion, um, all with Rutgers as the first part of the name there. And um, they, they're all pretty effective at, um, at resistance to downy mildew. And some of them have some good fusarium resistance built in as well, which that's another soil borne organism that tends to be problematic for basil for our climate. Um, and so it, you get a little bit different flavor profiles with those different ones that the, the Rutgers has put out and with Prospera. Um, so if you have a very favorite flavor, you can kind of, you can look in the seed catalogs and see and play with some of those different varieties and find one that suits it pretty, your taste um, pretty well. But having seen it on other farms in Chimicum, but not having seen it on my farm, I have exclusively used these downy mildew resistant varieties for the last several seasons and have not cross my fingers, knock on wood, seeing any downy mildew on basil and any of my plantings. Um, but, you know, it's, again, it has that very similar look, um, but it's less obvious at the outset of an infestation um, with basil than it is with spinach. With spinach, the top of the leaf looks very yellowy and bright in comparison to the rest of the leaf with the basil it's much more subtle and I think um, an infestation can get much more out of hand before you notice it um, with the basil just because it is a lot e easier to look past it when you're walking through um, a greenhouse or a field planting um, and you know I think that uh, in the Pacific Northwest, it really, if you want to have good basil, I really suggest it being in a greenhouse or under some amount of cover. And that will, um, if you manage your venting well, um, it will limit your uh, humidity there and your leaf wetness. And, um, you know, hope, hopefully some of my cultural practices there also lead to um, not having to deal with it. Um, drip irrigating, essential, I feel like, in, in, in that environment, um, you know, because if you have a greenhouse, you can, while you might prevent dew or rain, you can just as easily make a very humid environment if you're not careful. And if you're overhead watering, um, you're again, creating that water film on the leaves that those, those spores would, would love. Um, so I always implement the drip irrigation um, with the basal crops that I grow. 
Um, and I think, I don't know um, that biocontrol, if I ever, if I ever do see it on any of my basal plants, because I do have that upfront investment, I would possibly try a very harsh pruning and get it down to very few leaves and see if I could repeatedly be able to um, put something out there and prevent it from spreading. But, um, you know, again, I have no experience with that and no knowledge if that would really work. Um, I think that the talking to some of the um, seed companies, the basil world uh, has been really interesting. The cross species uh, plant breeding that they've implemented to try and get some of those resistances because you talked in your slide, Laurel, about um, how there's a couple of the different species of basils that show good resistance. And so you can risk with some of those varieties, I think that it would have been great to have been a taste evaluator in, at Rutgers and seen how all these different tastes came out because they made different crosses because they were bringing in some really strong, very different flavored varieties. Some of the Thai type basils um, that showed really good resistance and trying to bring those genetics and that resistance into an Italian type plant. Um, you know, they, they really probably had to, to work at getting a good flavor balance while maintaining that um, resistance. But I think it, again, it's pretty fascinating what they've been able to do uh, with some of the plant breeding to achieve the resistances that they've got. Um, the Prospera, they claim, is, you know, 100% control across the board for all the downy mildew resistance, while some of those Rutgers ones are slightly less. Um, but, uh, you know, hopefully that keeps it at bay for folks. Um, and really that's, you know, that's all the more that I have in terms of my experiences. Um, and, and so if anybody has any questions or comments about it, um, I'd love to be able to continue to answer those. Thanks, Scott. I think, yeah, yeah. it would be a great time um, if the folks that are on the call, if you have your own experiences on farm or in your garden and you um, want to share maybe some management practices you've utilized that have worked, um, other crops you've experienced it on, if you have um, stuff you want to speak to on that. This is kind of the time now um, to do questions for Laurel and, and Scott and then also kind of to discuss amongst yourselves as a group um, because the whole idea of our Dirt Talk events are for you guys to also share out. So. Um, I'm not sure if anybody on the call wants to be brave and unmute themselves and ask a question. You can also utilize the chat function. Or Laurel, if you have anything else you wanna to add to the discussion that maybe. Um, no, I, I think Scott, you hit on all the, um, I purposely left the details out of like irrigation and stuff like that and you, yeah. So thank you. Uh, sure. And um, I was going to say, you, you talked about a temperature range, and you're right, I did forget to put that in. I, if I remember correctly, at least with some, some types of downy mildew, it was something like four, between 46 and 70. So it's a kind of a big range of temperatures. Yeah. Um, and now, you know, that would kind of make sense with our, with our spring and, and fall temperatures but again um you know going into the fall is just much different than the the spring after the the winter break from those diseases um you know the fall even when it gets cold um there's a lot more dew so you have a lot more of that that uh film of water on the leaves and i do just feel like um you know mother nature is saying it's time to die it's time for leaves to begin to senesce you know and so um just the probability gets a lot higher to see some of the downy mildew out in the field even when the temperatures are kind of borderline on that range mm -hmm. and um i was just going to say in general that that dew that we experience even during the summer and particularly in the fall that that gets us for you know downy mildew but also late blight on tomatoes and it's just that moisture we have in the air here um, gives us some extra stuff to play with. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's extra challenging. You know, I think about 
um, a drier continental climate um, east of the mountains and in the middle of some of the areas in the middle of the country. And it's, uh, we, we are at a disadvantage that way. Yeah. Um, it looks All like right. Serena is asking about slideshow. Yeah, we're gonna, um, at the end, um, probably tomorrow, we'll send slides. Um, as well as a video link. We um, house all of our content on our online learning library, which is on the Regional Small Farms website. So we'll go ahead and send all that out with, along with some resource links to you folks um, and anybody who registered for the class. Um, Laurel and Scott, I know Scott, you um, have only had really experience with it with spinach mostly, but what about Laurel cucurbits? Because I know there's another farmer that has asked about that as well previously have do you have any experience um i've only i've only seen one probable case you know i so i've only been visiting farms for for a season now so there's a lot of stuff that i still need to see but um i did see um downy mildew on um i think it was both cucumbers and squash at a, a small it was kind of a homestead farm in squim but I haven't seen much of it. I, I wanted to, to comment that the downy mildews are in, in some cases newer diseases for us. Like if you um, if you're curious about downy mildew and just reading about it, if you flip through the, the different descriptions in the Pacific Northwest handbook, there's certain ones that, you know, the ones on brassicas have been around for a long time. Um, for other ones, they say, oh gosh, 2009 was the first major year that we had problems with this or um, the downy mildew on impatience. I think that showed up and wiped everybody out um, nurseries in 2011. So some of these downy mildew organisms are new um, to our area and some, in some cases, the whole country. So. Yeah, and if I can tag onto that, um, the, the input that I got from the seed the seed end of the industry was that a lot of that um, breeding is done in California for the baby leaf market because that's such a huge seed user um, and they do such monoculture um, growing conditions that it is highly likely that they can have just absolute crop failures if they get a new strain. Um, they breed for that environment but then they often are the first ones to also see these new strains that that will come about um, and then it sort of has a northward migration up the coast and so it can take time and it might show up one year in uh, California and it might take several seasons before it works its way up and then it's present in the Puget Sound area um, and so you know, sometimes we get a, a little bit of a free card. Um, and it also brings about some of the, the broader topic of plant breeding and breeding for um, multi-gene horizontal resistance versus the single gene uh, resistance tech technique that most of the, the plant breeding companies use. But that's a very different topic that we don't need to talk about too much today. Um, but uh, Jess, you had asked about some of the other crops, and um, while I haven't noticed it specifically in cucurbits, um, I'm growing more and more of them, and some of them being in the greenhouses now. Um, I was looking at the pictures that Laurel put up, and I was like, hmm, I'm, I know that I've seen the powdery mildew in the greenhouses late, but I wonder if I haven't seen a little bit of downy mildew showing up before the powdery mildew as the season progressed. And so this year I'm going to keep a little bit uh, better eye on things as the season goes along and see if I, I notice anything. And, and I'll let you know, Laurel, if I see anything that looks questionable if we want to get it tested. Yeah, and that's I think I've had a similar experience to you where where that kind of that picture that I showed of the top of the cucumber leaf with that kind of yellowing between the veins that I, I I've seen that here and there, but I don't you know that could be an, a symptom of another disorder, you know, whether it's nutritional right. or disease as well. So I I'm I'm really curious 
you know, if you see that, let's look at it. I, I'd love to come out and, you know, with my little hand lens and <laughs> take a look. Yeah. Because, yeah. I, um, yeah. I, and I, I agree with Scott, um, all these, these plant, new plant diseases, new insect pests, they all come up the I-5 corridor. <laughs> and so it's, and so I know most folks here are probably farmers, but I always, when I'm working with home gardeners, this is why I advocate buying local materials um because if you're if you're going to big box stores uh you know oftentimes they're coming from regional or or even you know further away nurseries these huge places and um you know you'll do a lot better buying local because who knows you know might be coming from an area in california or the willamette valley who already has some of these these things that we don't hear so buy local yeah <laughs> uh, that's a perfect way into what we were, I was going to say next is that, um, so most of these folks on the call probably already know, but Laurel is our regional IPM specialist. And so she's um, out of Clallam, but she services Clallam, Jefferson and Kitsap County. So if you have a pest that you're unsure of what exactly it is, or you have a hunch and you want her to confirm it, um, you can reach out to her. And I'm going to put in um, the chat. We have a new, it's not brand new, but um, new to some, we have a technical assistance request form on our website. It's um, housed on the sidebar um, and, you know, please feel free to use it. It's not just for identifying pests and utilizing Laurel's expertise, but um, if you have any farm assistance needs, you can feel free to fill out that form, be as detailed as possible. Um, and they all funnel to me and then I divert them to the proper person in the proper county. Um, we also have a new livestock specialist for those of you who, who have not heard for regional small farms, which is awesome. I have not had a livestock specialist for ever. So um, definitely take advantage of that if you guys need assistance um, in anything. But yeah, for pest specific, Laurel will be the one that would be connecting with you. Yeah, and so I, I just want to say I'm happy to come out to farms and, and look and see what's going on. Um, I fully acknowledge that there's a lot of stuff I still need to learn. And so, but I'm pretty good at knowing when I don't know. Um, and so we have other WSU specialists like Jenny Glass at the WSU um, plant clinic in Puyallup. And, um, and so I work very closely with her and anything that, that I find at all questionable you know, for my knowledge, I'll send on to her to get a confirmation. So um, we all work as a team. And so when you when you send an inquiry, you can expect to get the team. <laughs> all right. Does anybody else have, I, I see Diane just hopped on. Oh, we have a question that just popped up. It looks like Linda. So Scott, have you tested? Tasted any of the basil varieties from Rutgers? I grew Prospera in 2020, and my customers did not like it, especially those that I was selling it to for pesto. I grow basil in our tunnel with drip irrigation, and have not seen downy mildew. So I've decided to risk it and grow what tastes best at this point. But I'm open to continuing to trying resistant varieties. Um, you missed the slideshow, but we will definitely send that out so you have that also. Yes. Yeah, so. Um... I have uh, I have tasted the Rutgers Devotion and the Rutgers Obsession. Um, they each have slightly different uh, plant growth characteristics. One's taller than the other. I'm forgetting which one is which, and they have some some different taste characteristics to them. Um, I didn't grow Prospera um, at the same time as I grew those ones, so I don't have kind of a three way taste there um but i did grow um oh i'm blinking on the name uh another another one of my favorites and um the devotion and obsession are different they you know they are pulling a different flavor profile in so i would just recommend you know try a little bit and see put a few plants in and test them and see what you think of them um before you go too big on them. And if you haven't seen it, yeah, it might be worth the risk with staying with what your customers like, and then just trialing a little bit of the other ones and seeing if anything fits that, that uh, flavor profile, um, you know, cause really taste is the most important thing um, to, to the point that you still have a crop uh, with something like basil for sure. Does anybody else have any questions for Scott or for Laurel? 
we're at seven, but we definitely have time um, if anybody does have questions or want to chat more. I, I had a quick question for Scott. So the varieties, um, I've looked, I've poked around a little bit for, for downy mildew resistant varieties of basil, but in all the, the varieties that you're growing, are those hybrids or, or are some of them? Uh, I believe that they're all F1 hybrids. Okay. Um, that's, that's what I was, that's what I was seeing in the, in the seed providers that I was looking for, but yeah, so a lot of this disease resistance is found in in the hybrid crops. Yeah, um, you know, because they're they're having to cross a lot of a, a lot of things. So I'm thinking that these are at F1. I don't know that they've gone enough generations to to get a stable population out of them. Um, it would be worth asking, um, you know, if that's a concern for folks, that would be worth asking the seed companies um, kind of how they how they classify this. But I know it's it's been pretty new breeding efforts, which makes me think that um, it is, uh, you know, and it's a variety protected by a utility patent when I look under the Rutgers devotion, um, you know, so it is kind of hard to say by that information, whether or not it's really, um, whether the offspring of it, if you save seed would be very different than the parents, um, you know, and uh, yeah, but worth some more, some more questions. Thanks. And it's, and for such a, you know, a popular crop, it, if, even if you don't traditionally plant hybrids, this might be a, you know, a, a good place to make an, an exception. Um, yeah, you know, I don't know if they're, if they're going through, um, you know, with, to use brassicas as an example, they do a lot of pretty significant inbreeding on the parent lines um, to be able to get certain traits and then um, get that F1 cross and you save it and seed from it and you don't get anything like what you were experiencing um it can be pretty frustrating if they've just been you know crossing some very different parents um that aren't necessarily super inbred um you might be able to save seed and get something off of it but you know then when you see that it is um protected by utility patent technically you're not supposed to do that um you know and so I'd be reluctant to, to do that. Um, somebody at Rutgers has gone through a lot of work to do a lot of trial and error to come up with something that, that is downy mildew resistant. So perhaps they do uh, deserve to get paid for that. Thanks for that. Yeah. Yeah, and if there's any other questions, feel free to hop on um, while we're waiting to make sure nobody has any other questions. I'm gonna um, just give a little plug here. I just put in an evaluation link for the event. Um, if you could click that before you leave, just so it's up and you can take it, it's a quick, probably not even two minute evaluation. It just helps us be able to move forward with um, additional dirt talks. We ask you um, how this one was, as well as um, what you would like to see in the future. It helps us do some planning. So um, please do that. It'll also come in a link in a follow up email. And don't forget, this is going to be recorded for anybody who missed it. You can, you can uh, direct them to the Small Farms website. Definitely. It'll be on our online learning page. Yeah, so it doesn't sound like folks have any other questions. Um, so I'm gonna just take this moment and thank you to Scott for joining us and being our farmer partner in this Dirt Talk on Downy Mildew. And as always, thank you to Laurel for sharing your expertise with us and, and being able to um, help us along in the conversations that we have in this way. And it's always appreciated. So thank you so much. And um, we are, like I said, putting together additional dirt talks for this season. So um, all the way into the fall. Uh, so if you are not on our regional small farms newsletter, um, please sign up for that as well. I'll go ahead and put a link um, to that in the 
uh, response email or the follow-up email. So people have that in case you want to sign up for that to get all the latest news. And um, I just want to say a big shout out to Scott. He came in before before dark dark to do yeah. this. So. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I know, and it's not raining, and it's you know there was some sunshine out, and I just got the transplanter dialed in. So yes. <laughs> Yeah. you're welcome so thank you thank you for the sacrifice and he's probably being like oh my god there's still daylight can we just end this so i can go back out so hey there is daylight still so you can get back out there <laughs> awesome. yeah it, there's always there's always tomorrow yeah <laughs> yeah well thank you guys so much and thank you jess yeah take care <laughs>